Hey, Kyle. Hey. Is that a rocket launcher? <laughs> yeah. Real scary. Hey, Bob. You see Kyle's new rocket launcher? Yeah. Scary. Get better gear quicker. Do more damage sooner. Get a weekend of double XP when you pre-order Battlefield 4 from GameStop. Power to the players. Read them for Mature. GameStop. Even if you're not necessarily into video games, you probably know what GameStop is. They are, effectively, the place to go and get video games. Video game peripherals, video game consoles, and in that particular market, they've been the top dog for a long time. At least in terms of brick and mortar stores. They're not a big box, they're more of an outlet style, like Radio Shack, but they've seen a long string of success over the years. However, they're dying. Yeah. Yeah, they're bleeding pretty bad, in fact. And honestly, I don't think they can actually fix it. Now, I'm going to give you the facts about their history, as well as their current situation, and then offer my general opinion about it. So, unlike a lot of my other corporate downfall videos, this one is kind of a precursor to the actual fall. Though I am calling it, I'm pretty sure GameStop is going to go under sooner or later. Maybe not this year, maybe not next, but I don't think they can right themselves. Let's figure out why. GameStop can trace its roots all the way back to 1980 in another store called Babbage's, which some of you may remember. They were a Dallas, Texas-based software retailer. The store was founded by Harvard Business School classmates James McCurry and Gary M. Cousin. And it was named after Charles Babbage, an English mathematician, philosopher, inventor, and mechanical engineer. While they sold a lot of software at first, they realized that it was the video games that were doing particularly well. Specifically ones for, at the time, the top console, the Atari 2600. Then they started selling Nintendo games in 1987. And the following year, in 1988, they became a public company. By 1991, video games accounted for two-thirds of their sales. In 1994, they would merge, however, with Software Etc. to create Neostar Retail Group. Both individual brands would, of course, be underneath that holding company, but both Babbage's and Software Etc. operated as independent subsidiaries and retained their respective senior management teams. They would eventually be merged into a single organization in May of 1996, amid a decline in sales. Since both were kind of doing the same thing, they were kind of competing with each other, or at least restricting each other's expansion, so they just put them into one. But this didn't actually help. They were forced to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protections, and a few leadership changes later, it was decided that they had to actually sell the assets of Neostar in November of 1996. The person that bought them was Leonard Riggio, who got a hold of them for $58.5 million, and he happened to be the founder of Software Etc. initially. He was also the chairman and principal stockholder of Barnes & Noble. With the company under his control, Riggio dissolved the old holding company and created a brand new one named Babbage's Etc. And things started to actually kind of right themselves. Three years later, in 1999, Babbage's Etc. launched a whole new brand, GameStop, focusing specifically on video games, with an initial 30 stores located in multiple strip malls. They also decided to get in early to the online storefront and launched GameStop.com, which did allow customers to purchase their video games from them online. GameStop.com was also promoted in stores that were still under Babbage's and Software Etc. branding. The same year GameStop became a thing, Barnes & Noble booksellers would fully purchase Babbage's Etc. for $215 million. Just a few months after they did this, Barnes & Noble also acquired Funko, the company that owned another video game retailer you may remember, Funko Land, for $160 million. And that's actually where Game Informer originally comes from. Funko had that magazine, but when Barnes & Noble bought them, they of course got a hold of Game Informer as well. And Babbage's Etc. was placed as a wholly owned subsidiary underneath Funko, which was underneath Barnes & Noble. And Funko was renamed to just GameStop Incorporated in December of 2000, in anticipation of an initial public offering for that company. 
little over a year later in February of 2002, they once again became a public company via initial public offering, though Barnes & Noble retained control over it with 67% of the outstanding shares and 95% of voting shares. They would have control until October of 2004, when they decided to distribute their 59% stake, making GameStop independent. But that didn't slow them down. Once all this happened, because I know that was a lot of complicated corporate shuffling all over the place, but now we're dealing with the GameStop you guys probably actually are familiar with. Independent, on their own, this is GameStop Incorporated, here we are. It was a long journey, but we're here. And what are we gonna do? Oh my god, we're gonna buy everyone! The thing about GameStop, I think more than anything else, is that not only were they incredibly aggressive with acquiring other brands and just overriding them with their own, but on their own, they're a good brand. That is a great top tier name, GameStop. You stop there for games. It's simple, catchy, and people know exactly what that store is about before they even go inside. Especially in the early 2000s with newer console generations, the video game industry was exploding, responsible for circulating billions of dollars. And at the time, gamers still needed a place to go to get those games, especially when they eventually gave people absolutely no choice. In 2005, GameStop would acquire EB Games, formerly known as Electronics Boutique, for $1.44 billion. That acquisition was huge, not just in price, but also because it expanded their operations to Australia, Canada, Europe, and New Zealand, bringing their total stores up to 4,250. In 2007, they acquired Rhino Video Games, who operated 70 stores. In 2008, they acquired Free Record Shop's 49 Norwegian stores. Also in 2008, they acquired Micromania, a French video game retailer, for 700 million, and that gave them 332 French locations. In 2009, they got a majority stake in Jolt Online Gaming, an Irish browser game studio. In 2010, they acquired Congregate, a San Francisco-based website for browser-based games. In 2011, they acquired Spawn Labs and Impulse, which were technology developers in the online gaming scene, though both would be shut down by 2014. In 2012, they got a hold of Buy Mytronics, a Denver-based online marketplace for consumer electronics. In October of that same year, they acquired a 49.9% ownership interest in Simply Mac and acquired the remaining ownership in November of 2013. In November of 2013, they got a hold of Spring Mobile, a Salt Lake City-based retailer of AT&T branded wireless devices. They got a hold of 163 Radio Shack locations in February of 2015. In July of 2015, they acquired GeekNet. And on August 3rd, 2016, they acquired 507 AT&T store chains. And how in the world were they making all this money? What was happening here? GameStop, for a long time, seemed like they were unstoppable. They were everywhere, acquiring everyone, just all-consuming. And the answer was twofold. Excellent branding and used game sales. See, GameStop didn't just sell brand new games and brand new consoles. They sold used as well, kind of like a pawn shop, but no pawning involved. Basically, once you played a game, you could take it to GameStop and they'd give you some money for it. Or store credit, and usually store credit was more than the cash they would give you. Either way though, they would then take that game and then put it back on the shelf and sell it again. Basically always for more than they had paid you to buy it in the first place. Though that does make sense because they wouldn't make any money otherwise. A lot of gamers for a while really liked this setup because it meant that they didn't necessarily have to hold on to games they weren't going to play anymore. Not every gamer is also a collector, you know? Some people like to hold on to their physical media, but not everyone cares about that. And what if you buy a game you just don't like? That happens a lot. So if you didn't like a game, why would you keep it? You weren't gonna play it anymore. Get a little bit of money from GameStop and spend it on something else. This business model just printed money for GameStop. Although game developers and publishers absolutely hated it because they got no money out of this exchange. But there was nothing illegal about it, so there really wasn't much they could do beyond attempting to put arbitrary restrictions on newer consoles to make it harder to play used games. But gamers, um. Uh, it really pushed back on that, so they had to back down. But if the business model is so good, why are they starting to fail? After all, everything sounds great. Well, for GameStop's purposes, and the reason why they're on a significant downslope, 
is due to a couple factors. The big one, in terms of the market, is that everything's shifted in a way that they really can't account for. It is true they had an online store pretty early, and that's good, but especially when it comes to games, a lot of people just aren't buying games physically anymore. With the rise of PC gaming especially, it means that platforms like Steam, Epic Game Store, or God help you, the EA thing, I don't even know what they're calling it now, Basically, there are digital game shops where you can just purchase your game digitally. These shops are able to provide not only more convenient ways to get a hold of new games, but also generally for really, really amazing prices. If you are a gamer and you utilize Steam, I don't have to tell you that some of the sales they have are absolutely insane. And the reason they can do this is that digital sales are, well, cheaper to do in general because there's no physical item to pay for. There's no shipping infrastructure, there's none of that. It's just a digital storefront. It's much cheaper to operate overall, and you can afford to not charge as much. As long as the consumer doesn't really care about not physically owning their games, then it is generally the better option for a lot of people. This is something that GameStop has trouble competing with because they're still mostly brick and mortar. But I think the bigger issue with them is that not only are they very, very, very large, so when they do crash, they're gonna crash real hard, real quick, the other major factor is something we haven't actually discussed with the, a lot of the other companies because, frankly, I just didn't have to. Though in this case, I feel it is very important, and that's something called consumer trust. You can have the best retail operation on the planet. Perfect logistics, perfect supply chains, perfect store layouts, and the perfect product. You could do everything right. If the consumer doesn't like you, you're gonna fail. And this is why GameStop's fate is likely inevitable. They're gonna struggle, they're gonna try, they're gonna shake, rattle, and roll, but eventually they're going to go under because generally speaking, people just don't like them anymore. It's not just a matter of Steam is cheaper. I mean, it is a factor, but even if they weren't, people probably would still go to them instead, or even Walmart. And the reason for this is that GameStop has made it a point over the years, because they're so prevalent, to make a lot of customers pretty angry with them, as well as former employees. GameStop has never really been a great place to work by most accounts. And when it comes to the customer experience, it varies quite a bit, but most of the general issues have to do with a lot of their policies. Remember those used game sales I mentioned? Yeah, that accounted for a lot of money by them, but they would upcharge them significantly compared to what they would give the customer. Some games they'd only offer you literal pennies, like maybe 75 cents tops, and then put it on the shelf for 20 bucks. Even in a pawn shop, you can at least negotiate a better price. And while it is understandable that GameStop would upcharge because they have to make money, that makes sense, it kind of entered the landscape of taking advantage of the customer on that level and people got wise to it after a while. Plus, when most people started buying their games digitally, they didn't even have used games to give GameStop anymore. And most of their turnaround efforts tried to put them in markets they had really no experience in, like the mobile phone industry. Oh, oh good, all right, yeah, Radio Shack tried that and it didn't work for them either. It was a bad idea, because their plan, and mind you, this is in the 2010s, was to start accepting used phones and tablets and get into that market. That's neat and all, but the market for used phones and tablets is actually pretty limited. And like I said, most people, when they get phones, they don't buy them used. They don't even buy them new directly. They get them through a plan. That was Radio Shack's issue, and it was one of the reasons why GameStop's strategy failed in that regard. It just wasn't something that people were interested in spending money on. COVID-19 didn't help them either, particularly how they acted during it, because they tried to stay open, and many people criticized them for this, but their argument is that they were an essential business, and their employees were essential workers. Really? GameStop is essential business during a pandemic, is it? Is it? Is it? Interesting! I, I'm not sure you count, uh, you know? To their credit, the board actually took pay cuts to survive COVID-19. The CEO took a 50% cut and the other executives took a 30% cut to offset losses. So, I mean, that's actually kind of applaudable given the situation, but still, you guys probably shouldn't have remained open at all and focused on your online stuff. How's that going, by the way? Well, not great. I mean, you can order your games from GameStop Online still, and that's good, 
But if you're at a computer ordering a game, why would you why would you go to GameStop for that? Like this is kind of their issue. No one's gonna go to them anymore for games because they don't trust them. They would go to anywhere else, basically. You get it faster from Amazon, or you can just buy it cheaper digitally. GameStop really has no way forward here, because people don't even like them very much. And even the ones that do, are mostly people that just don't know any better. Younger people that see GameStop and think it's cool branding, just like we all did when we first saw them. But over time, that bad customer experience just can't be overcome. The most recent news when it comes to GameStop has to do with their attempt to go into the NFT market. Yeah, yeah, they tried that. They canceled it. They, they, they stopped. They said they were not going to do that anymore. They shuttered the whole thing earlier this year, thank God, because it was a stupid idea. They were mocked heavily for it. And it was kind of a sign that they were really desperate to try to figure out a way to make money. They've been losing it and on a steep decline for years. And even Game Informer has recently been shuttered. Suddenly, unexpectedly, earlier this month, as I speak. Granted, the fact that they still had a physical magazine in print in 2024 was kind of amazing. And honestly, they probably should have shut it down years ago, but they're already in the process of downsizing. For example, in June of 2023, all their stores located in Ireland were shut down. Many locations are starting to be liquidated as they attempt to try to achieve profitability. And in March of this year, they announced they were looking to cut an unannounced number of staff, trying in vain to achieve some level of profitability. But with brick and mortar, uh, there's only so much staff you can cut. You can't do brick and mortar without staff, unless it's like a vending machine, but that's not what you are. This is GameStop's biggest issue. They can't compete with big box stores, which are pretty much their only physical competition, because big box outlets have a whole bunch of other stuff in addition to the games. And yeah, GameStop has more games and is more specialized in games, but the customer experience is very mixed with them, and most people would prefer to just go online or just buy digitally on Steam. Because listen, when I buy a game off Steam, I'm not harassed to join a membership program, nor am I asked if I want a freaking warranty that I absolutely know is definitely going to be a scam. Listen, this is not how you get customers back. And some of you might be saying, well, who made you an expert on business? You're right, it's probably unfair for me to call myself an expert on business. I don't think that's a reasonable statement to make. But I'm fairly confident in my opinion that GameStop's going to suffer a pretty startling collapse relatively soon. They can't possibly keep this up. Not with the way the market is and not with the way the market's going. It's getting more digital, not less. And yes, there are a resurgence of gamers that are trying to push for the idea of more physical copies of things. Just because of how um, sketchy it can be to only purchase games digitally. Because some companies will tell you you're actually purchasing a license to play the game, but not actually physically the game, and we they don't like don't like that, which is totally fair. But but even among those individuals, when they want to go and get a physical game, they still don't go to GameStop to do it. And I just don't think they can ever overcome that problem. And just so we're clear, before you ask, what about the short squeeze? Yeah, that's its own story. If this video does well, maybe I'll do a video on the GameStop short squeeze. When a whole bunch of Reddit users decided to manipulate the stock market in order to mess up the plans of some hedge funds, only for certain stockbroking companies like Robinhood to cut them off, which I'm pretty sure is an illegal thing to do. Like I said, it's a whole story. It really doesn't have much to do with GameStop's core business operations. It was just their stock being manipulated. In terms of them, it did really nothing in the long term because they still haven't fixed their actual business practices. They still haven't been able to regain trust. They still haven't been able to regain a foothold. And in my opinion, the best thing they can do is keep slowly downsizing as much as they can. Sometimes in business, you have to amputate, especially if it's a money-losing operation. I don't care how much you want to keep stores open. As of February of 2024, you still have 4,169 locations. You cannot sit there and tell me every single one of them is profitable. I haven't seen your books, but I don't believe they could possibly be. Get rid of the ones that aren't and come up with a different business model. Otherwise, this whole company is going to be gone. I give it maybe five years tops or at least under new ownership and with a whole new business model. But yeah, that's GameStop. Good times. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267 
Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson Throw the Videos, Lord Off 444, Iser for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Redline, NS Productions 8104, Wheel Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Alinsky, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131, Jess 232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Hayton DeGrow, No, Kurt Forkham, Mr. Sleepy, Harry, Drew Debris, George Kenny, Kevin Wood, Liam Wright, Morris Hillman Productions, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Hannah Bird, Durausche, Windy City Rails, A Person 723, William Nemo, Dr. Racer 78, Shimasu, Murder Drone Stall, Eric Hutton, AET Museum, NJ1969, Metal for Life Guy, Andrew Bowen, Crimson Rose, Ryan Weofer, Jared Brussel, Zintac M, Boss K, Orange Glass, Andy, The Conceptualist, Akaleti, Ohio Trucker 1, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.